Welcome to The Intro Zone, a show about the Microsoft 365 Intelligent Internet. I'm Chris McNulty, here today with my partner edition co-host, the one, the only, Mark Cashman. Well, hello there, Chris. Very excited to be here again with you as always. Well, I'm very excited to be here and I don't see you here. Where's your here? <laughs> my here is in a three-dimensional SharePoint space. You know, it's moving at a preview and I've just now moved into a comfortable zone of a three-dimensional mark. So I'll send you a link and, and then you can see me. Well, that's interesting. I, I'm actually in my bedroom because all of the other virtual studios in my home are occupied right now. You've got to get ahead on this programming. Once we get it in the calendar that we're going to sync up, you got to book that room. You know how we have those new Teams devices that you can put on the outside of the meeting room that show the meeting room schedule for the day? Yes, yes. I, I need to get one of those for my office here. Uh, something tells me if you just type in, hey, community, what are you using at the front of your door to indicate that you're in a meeting? I've seen a lot of people with a lot of different solutions. Probably highly recommended. And if you're being sequestered into this room because you're booking late again book ahead i could also just you know i don't know put a coat hanger on the door to keep people out <laughs> enough of of the joys of virtual studio work we have other things that we're responsible for and at microsoft our mission is to help individuals and organizations across the planet achieve more we don't do this alone. So each month we sit down with a different partner and one of their customers to help them share their story about their journey with Microsoft technologies and the kinds of services and solutions that they've found. On this next episode of our Microsoft Partner Series for the Interzone, we're talking with our partner Joro Ainu from Veranon Solutions and a special conversation with Gary Moss at Stanley Black & Decker that is a Veranon customer. You know, it's interesting, you know, when we were getting our notes together for this, Stanley Black & Decker certainly is a well-known brand to anyone who's ever had to do home repair work, tools and power equipment and so forth. Um, but Veranon's not as well-known. In doing some research there, I mean, obviously, they are a key player in our content partner program. You know, it's funny. There are some organizations around the world who are very vocal. They have... MVPs and evangelists who go to conferences and speak all the time, physically or virtually, they get booths. And I think we're all acquainted with those parts of our community, right, Mark? Yeah, we are. And, you know, once you start to plug in the who they are, because once you understand what they are, where they are and what they do, you'll see it's a compliment to the community. Uh, they are global uh, in their reach. They're also global in, in the context of apps. They focus on helping people leverage, migrate, move to, use everything from SharePoint teams, Yammers, building flows, leveraging the power platform and obviously connected with Chris here and up to speed on everything. Project Cortex, if you're moving in that direction, uh, Veranon would be able to tackle. I think the important part is the global reach and what you'll hear us talk about is how they're able to take what might be a very custom migration, a move of content, in this case from OpenText's eRoom, into SharePoint in the cloud in Microsoft 365. And there isn't a, a standard tool that's just a point and click and do. And I think that's really interesting. If you layer on top of, you know, all of their core and base skills, Chris, in, in terms of your content services program, what is the importance of that ability to take a custom approach from a migration perspective? There's the custom approach and there's also the general approach. Act one, scene one. I mean, Stanley Black & Decker is an organization that should feel familiar to, to many in that they have a large information architecture that's been spread out across multiple repositories. Some is in the cloud, some is on-premises. They've had various luck with each of those. They've gone through mergers, acquisitions, the company grows, the company reorganizes. And how do you make the information architecture match the operational architecture? And I think that's a place... Veron comes in and they're they're sort of a tweener as a company in many ways. And I know they do many other things, but there are companies that focus purely on services or purely on software. And you know, Veronon is, I know, captured a lot of their expertise about how to migrate into an accelerator toolkit. It's got software in it. It's not something you can buy, but it's something that it's Stanley Black and Decker fills up people's toolboxes. Veranon has their own migration toolbox, and they will take out the right tools and um, understand the right combinations based on where someone um, has been and where they need to go, what needs to be built and constructed to get them on their way. 
So if you think about what then was constructed, I think one important aspect, I know we'll probably hear it from our guests in some respect uh, at a point in time when they're describing, you know, what it is they did and, and some of the challenges and solutions. But just let's talk a, a few numbers to, to level set who Black & Decker is uh, and the approach that they took with with what they had and where they're coming from. So they are established 1910, headquartered in Connecticut. OK, that's a little bit before SharePoint was available. Skip ahead a few years. We do know that they've been a SharePoint customer for the last 13 years, probably nearing now between 14 and 15 years. So they've been on the SharePoint platform and to Chris's point, have been leveraging it, you know, for a, a bunch of things. Within eRoom, we knew they have about nine terabytes of content. That's a lot of what we're going to be talking about. What is that content? How did they move and migrate it? And the experience that they now have having that more in a, a centralized place, that SharePoint platform. But to spread all of this is then that uh, near of a more centralized place for content for about 9,400 employees. So not everybody headquartered in Connecticut. And like Chris mentioned, that is also split across a number of acquisitions over the years. So they've been growing. But with those numbers, you know, a lot of it is making sure that they do it right. Because if there is the base of employees, if not all of them or some that are used to when the content was in eRoom, that migration is one thing, but there's also then the experience and the training. And, you know, I think Veranon was there not just for the operational aspects of moving the content. That's important. But I think it's also then landing it appropriately so that it fits the business, matches what the employee's expectations are. And so not to gloss over that, I think also, Chris, that is a big part of what makes a, a set of customers uh, their values to carry forward. But also from a partner perspective, what layers in the real value of not just being task oriented and executing, but just actually looking at the breadth of business. And folks, I just did a little bit of side research. I wanted to confirm my impression. So Mark has inadvertently taken us back into the 70s time machine because <laughs> the tagline, we want to help you do it right, was one of the lines of the Stanley theme song in the commercials of the 1970s. Whoa. <laughs> All right. Fast forward to the future, Chris. Let's kind of turn the corner and hear from both Veranon and Black & Decker to see the challenges that they face, the strategy that they took, and then finally the best part, the outcome, the solution. So up next on the IntraZone Partner Edition, we're welcoming in Joro Ainu from Brian and Solutions. Um, and our very special guest this week is Gary Moss from Stanley Black & Decker. Gentlemen, welcome to the IntraZone. Hello. Thank you. Let me give you a chance to introduce yourselves to our audience. Gary, let me start with you. Talk a little bit about your role at Stanley Black & Decker and how you've come to be associated with Microsoft 365. Yes, certainly. Uh, so I'm the Director of Applications Service Assurance here at Stanley Black & Decker. My history with SharePoint dates back, crikey, probably um, 15 years now. Um, and it tied closely with our collaboration tools. We had eRoom as also a tool, uh, which has kind of stuck with me, although SharePoint responsibility has moved away. eRoom kind of stuck with me for several years as we look really to, to find an opportunity to migrate to SharePoint. Primary responsibilities, though, are really in the operational aspects of our application landscape, uh, including things like ITSM, our 24-7 monitoring platform, and release management, that kind of area. SharePoint and in particular eRoom were really sort of taggers on, I guess, that we've been hanging on to for a while. I have to ask, because you said 15 years, what was the first SharePoint project that you remember from the early days? SharePoint was uh, introduced as Stanley Black & Decker as kind of a replacement for eRoom. We've made a strategic decision to, to work with SharePoint. We took several attempts really to move away from eRoom because it had been so embedded in our environment. And what we did is we used opportunities to find business problems and try and solve them by building that solution in SharePoint. So one of the first things we really worked on was some fairly rudimentary things, to be honest with you, around uh, trying to develop on-call calendars for our operations teams and things like that, and workflows for some of the business processes uh, that were out there in the field already. And obviously raw, straightforward collaboration and document repository. Well, thank you for, for sticking with us for those years. Joro, can you give us a sense of not only what your company offers to the world as a partner of Microsoft um, with Microsoft 365 and beyond, but maybe a little bit about who you are and, and how you got into this world of tech? 
Thank you for having us. My interaction with SharePoint, I think, dates back to the, about 2008 when we started with SharePoint 2007. What essentially happened is I was previously a content management person. In fact, our organization is really founded by a group of folks that are in content management. Uh, we come from a different line of content management products. In fact, quite a few of them as a precursor to that. So realistically speaking, the senior members have about 20 years of experience. But in SharePoint, we just jumped in about uh, 2008. The things that were the impetus behind us moving to SharePoint really was people wanting to move away from whatever it is into SharePoint. And uh, at that point, I kind of branched out vis-a-vis uh, -vis the other principles of the organization and decided to kind of focus more on SharePoint and have stayed with it since then. Uh, so in the spirit of uh, candid declaration, we, we've been in SharePoint only for about 12 years. And I lead the portion of the organization that has both the tools, i.e. the products, uh, as well as uh, not only the, the products, but the, the migration services tied to that. And we've migrated from many organizations into terabytes of content from, you name it, Eroom, uh, Stellant, uh, Lotus Notes, uh, App Extender. I mean, these are things that you guys may not be familiar with. Uh, Documentum, DocuShare, uh, Jive, we used to be called ASPS. Most people don't know about it. Those types of products. So. Really, really, I focus now on uh, jumping off something else into SharePoint even more than anything else. And organizationally, I've done primarily that for, for the past 12 years. My group also does uh, SharePoint-based development. Uh, in addition to this, the power to, to take a kind of a, a swag at it, it's probably about 50-50. So 50% of the time, we're doing some level of additional work on the SharePoint side of the platform, uh, all the way to the cloud. Uh, the other 50% really is dedicated to migration. That's really fascinating. I'm going to ask you a little bit more about kind of what your journey is, has been with content services and with Microsoft in a few minutes. Uh, but I'd kind of like to turn our attention back to Gary. So hopefully our audience is familiar with Stanley Black and Decker. You know, I, I certainly am, you know, my youngest days seeing Stanley ads in the, in the Winter Olympics and saying, I want to get some of those tools so I can build a clubhouse. And most middle-aged men in the suburbs, I have a good collection of Black and Decker tools downstairs. But when you think about how you came to be engaged with Verinan and the initiatives that you're responsible for, can we talk about how you first got acquainted there and what that journey has been like? Yeah, certainly. Well, Veronon really were uh, the answer to a problem we were, that we had. And that is, as I said earlier, we've been, we've been using eRoom as a tool for many years within Stanley Black & Decker. It was used extensively by our product development teams, uh, marketing, finance. A lot of engineering teams were, were leveraging it very heavily. We knew we wanted to get off eRoom. We'd been really not maintaining it as well as we could. The product really didn't seem to have a future for us either. So we knew we'd already you know, committed to SharePoint. The challenge though is the years of use had developed a large amount of content that we, at one point we felt the only way to move it was going to be manually. And that was not going to be acceptable to our business partners. We had concerns over some of the workflows that developed and the way they were using some of the proprietary components of eRoom. So we started to look for a migration partner uh, and bearing on and their easy to share uh, proprietary tool set seemed to be the ideal answer to take that content and, and move it into our SharePoint 0365 environment. So really that's how it, how it began. We needed a solution for our business users so we could move their content um, essentially seamlessly uh, without their direct involvement in the actual move process. Clearly they were heavily involved in, in validation early on and so we were comfortable uh, that the, you know, that the tool set did what it said it would do and that Veronon were capable and competent in doing that, which they proved very successful with. And then we went through the, you know, you know, nearly a uh, eleven-month migration process. Uh, but really, it was that tool set and their their capability that was what drew us to them. It would be safe to say that the new run state is beyond eRoom, uh, more adoption, and a lot of your content in SharePoint or or wherever you put it from the migration. If that was OneDrive, if that was if you're now into the Teams world, can you paint a picture that is? post-migration. I'd love to hear the breadth of what you're using now. And probably Chris, I know, is wanting to ask the kind of the value on top as it moves forward, what you've been doing uh, with Veronon to build out sort of the, the new phase of what you're using. Our primary engagement with Veronon was solely to move the content from eRoom to SharePoint, uh, O365. Everything went to our O365 environment. We had a very small footprint there. 
SharePoint really grew from, from a very small footprint in 0365 to over nine terabytes of data that moved from eRoom. We also do have an on-prem, although I call it on-prem, it's a hosted SharePoint environment that we're now discussing a migration to 0365. Although we, can, we consider it our own managed environment, it is actually in Azure. We moved it to Azure from our own servers about 18 months ago. Uh, really during a data center migration, it was easier to move it up to Azure. And we're now looking at a move from that environment into the O365 SharePoint environment to give us a, a common platform. Um, Teams is definitely on the horizon. Uh, we're working right now to, to set that up. Sponsorship uh, to, to develop Teams. Obviously, with remote collaboration forefront right now in the current world, uh, we're looking at how we could leverage that you know, within our business. So certainly Teams is a future for us. With regard to how we're using SharePoint, um, it's given us a lot more search capability. We were struggling in the old eRoom environment to really provide good um, searching capability, far better tools for managing uh, the actual content itself. And we did a lot of cleanup around ownership of data, a lot more classification of that data. And we also introduced multi-factor authentication for some of our third-party collaborators uh, with whom we work. So there was a lot of things that would really strengthen some of the security around the product there as well. I'm curious to get a sense of what do collaboration tools look like in a company that is known for tools? Like how widespread is your workforce? And remote work, I can imagine being a little bit more complex for an organization that is dealing with you know physical assets and physical assembly and physical distribution. Yeah, and again, that, that obviously is going to depend largely on the role uh, you have within the company. I mean, certainly manufacturing is is obviously you know fairly physically bound, uh, as with distribution and many other aspects. But there's a lot of other areas, um, particularly IT, where you know we've been very easily uh, moved to a to a mobile workforce. As far as uh, geography, I think uh, you know we've over fifty thousand employees. I forget the number of countries, but certainly a very global country, heavy presence in most of the major countries of the world. So yeah, we, we're very global you know, very distributed workforce. As far as collaboration tools, we've used pretty much everything over the years that's, that's you know, you, you typically hear, your, your Zooms, your Skypes, you, you name it. We, we've used it all. As I say, Teams is is also on the on the horizon. When you added the security measures with multi-factor authentication to bring in third-party clients, or it sounds maybe partners, uh, in, the, in the workflow of your distribution or life cycle of product uh, development, Maybe just a little lens on who those external users are, not by name, but but just by their role, uh, and how it is that they do have access to content for a period of time with security in place, and maybe what was life like pre SharePoint, pre Microsoft 365, in the ease of that. What does that look like for the content and and just that descriptor of the people that you're working with? Yeah, I mean, the for the most part, these these are folks that are working on. Could be anything, I, I suppose, from you know component design and for introduction into tools or whatever, particularly the engineering space. With regard to how we integrate them, largely they are or they are always authenticated against our own Active Directory environment. We treat them largely like uh, consultants within our business, with a owning manager who's responsible for their account creation, termination, and cycling through the the renewal of that account on a on a cyclic basis. What multi-factor gave us really is both for internal and external contractors or, or employees even, is that if the you know somebody's accessing some of our content with a non-SBD device for any reason, that we're asking for that additional verification that they are who they say they are, even though they may have what appear to be good credentials. You know, we felt that was just really a next level of security, particularly when we're dealing with, to say, third-party vendors who are not on our network or accessing some of our content uh, remotely from another source. So that's really what, as much as it gave us uh, in YC. And again, it's not an area I have a lot of direct responsibility in, but we did introduce it as part of this migration. So let me bring Juro back in, because one thing that's interesting about that is, you know, an 11 month migration process. I mean, I remember back in the day when things were running on premises, you know, occasionally you might tell people, we're going to shut the server down for the weekend to run an upgrade. How do you approach, you know, what and what tips would you give that you kind of have learned along the way about a transition and a transformation which can last almost a year? 
Yeah, uh, well, plan, 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 plan. And I got to tell you, your partner is absolutely critical in this because uh, without them, planning is kind of hopeless. A lot of times folks are of the opinion that, hey, uh, golly gee, here's the partner. Let's hand them the keys and move along. Well, that doesn't work that way. Early on, we're really married to each other. So, and I'll touch a little bit about kind of our methodology and how to handle this. The initial step in any large scale, and I mean, this thing's nine terabytes uh, big migration is we have a very regimented analysis process up front that goes through your existing content and tries to identify we're really interested in potholes. I'm not interested in stuff that's going to be going into SharePoint, no problem. I'm exclusively interested in things that are going to be a problem. And you bring this uh, to your clients attention. They are to help you through this exercise of saying, this is going to be a situation where we got a square peg and a round hole. We need to kind of be creative. We have to bring set of recommendations up front as to how we attack it. Really, really, by the time the analysis phase is done, everything that's going to be bad news is pretty much known to everybody involved. You bring attention to the issues that are going to happen at the end. There's a good chance the client will shoot you. That, that's a key part of the process. The next part, and I think Gary said this already. He said, early on, I don't care how many times these guys have migrated here. We were embedded in the exercise to make sure we validate. And that's exactly it. In the prototype, you give them a rundown of how you get away with a kind of 11-month migration. The key is you morsel this out in terms of what is a meaningful chunk that could be done at each particular period. Now, it could be monthly, it could be biweekly, it could be whatever it is. You essentially, as part of your analysis and your, your post-prototype plan, chunk this out into meaningful pieces. Many a time, and I've had a couple of clients where they took a, a, a very, very large piece of content and demanded that it all go live in one day. It really, really, uh, it can be done. I've done it a couple of times, uh, unwillingly, uh, but, it, but it, it tends to be a bit of a nightmare. You know, we, we've done this for over a decade. The way that at Stanley Black & Decker or anywhere else this works really well is you in no way, shape or form can negatively impact the productivity of the content owners uh, the day before and the day after migration. It has to be slicker than that. It has to be perfect. All permissions have to be there. All existing method has to be perfect. It has to be that way. And the way that it happens is we have windows of time and variably on a weekend, we refer to as an incremental migration where we first migrate all the content and then we do what's called a delta or incremental migration on a weekend to just grab whatever is new. So an 11 month migration actually becomes not an 11 month migration, but let's say hypothetically speaking, you need eight months of that to be full prod migration. You know, say biweekly, you're looking at 16 separate migrations, which are very manageable. Yeah, I think the mindful approach outside of painting the picture of how it's going to happen. And as you said, you know, the, the pros and cons, there, there are some give and gets. Uh, I always know that there are those interesting conversations of we see you have a lot of content. And if you aren't thinking about leaving some of it behind, let's have that discussion. But ultimately, the planning, the execution, whether it's one day or over several days, uh, I think the thing I, I have heard resonates most from what I've heard with other migrations and just other success stories is being mindful, planful, upfront, honest and then get to work. There is just content to move and you know how to do it and customer needs to be aware. And then there is at the time when you press the magic button and on the other side of it, of course, is the upside that was part of the plan. So I congratulate you both for being at that state. And we certainly hope that not only initially, but but ongoing it has been the right decision. Why, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Internally across Stanley Black & Decker, how do you manage user expectations when there's a point in time where half of your workforce is getting all the latest and greatest stuff, you know, which hopefully increases the you know, demand for those who don't have it yet? How do you manage those user expectations in a rollout of that scale? That's interesting. The funny thing is, though, quite often our user base will look at things and the familiarity means there's a certain caution towards the change. What we were able to do with the eRoom migration is demonstrate the potential risk associated with eRoom to our senior leadership. We got buy-in very early on from senior leadership and very specific champions within the lines of business who are going to be responsible for 
providing sign off for the migrations. As far as other folks feeling that they were losing out or missing out on the, the latest and greatest that other teams were moving to, I think there was really uh, an understanding of the timeline that we developed. I think we, you know, we had to work with a lot of the teams to make sure, and, and hence the, you know, the 11 months, a lot of that was around freeze periods where we're not going to touch finance data during you know, financial month ends, et cetera, uh, to Jared's point, so that we were minimizing any potential impact that we might have to productivity. So I think people were just respectful of the timeline. They recognized it. You know, they knew they were going to the latest and greatest. They saw the benefits of it. We did a lot of work with, with Jaro and the team to make sure that the landing page for SharePoint was as sympathetically laid out as it could be to minimize the visual change and impact of having moved from one tool to another, which again can be kind of a, that scary shock and awe to a new user base. And we also made sure that we had provided supplemental training material both internally from within the teams and also we did engage a third party to help with some additional training material for SharePoint, again, to soften that transition blow for folks moving from a, a tool they've been using for, you know, for many people for, for many, many, many years into a new tool that they, they really touched on only briefly. Can you just speak to a little bit maybe through uh, your thoughts on strategy to that change management and what works best, not on paper, but for your company? You're right. Whenever you introduce something new, there's got to be something that compels the business to to move towards that. It's, it, it's not just always a change for change sake. So there's got to be something compelling about the the new solution that draws the the business along. In many cases, I think you know as we look towards teams now, whether that's displacing existing tool sets that we can you know, and there's a financial carrot on a stick there that we're, we're drawing people towards, or whether it's the functionality of the new tool set that we can showcase. I think there are two ways we would would look to introduce that change. For many people, the as I say, I mean, quite often it's the the, the day to day familiarity that they're they're used to. They don't like to change necessarily to a new tool unless it's it's been well explained to them. We've documented what we're doing and we've communicated well through our organisation of how the new tool or the new solution is going to look and how they're going to interact with it. We make sure that we do you know solid UAT testing with you know representative samples of our business and and quite often use a very train the trainer type technique, you know, you, you win your champions over and have them propagate some of the, the benefits and the training within those teams. Um, I think that helps soften the blow and, and introduces change in a more palatable fashion. That's how we did, we progressed with SharePoint. Slowly at first, did our, our initial pilot tests, had engaged the right um, champions within our business, had them confirmed and happy uh, with the approach and the way we were doing things. And they helped us really to train within their own teams and to uh, sell the message for us um, on top of our, our own overall uh, IT communications. As soon as you have the business singing the same song, you're winning their hearts and souls as well. So, Gerard, you know, I'd kind of like you to kind of expand on kind of your experiences with Stanley Black & Decker's, what you take away from that, you know, what kinds of services are you well positioned to deliver paralleling the success you've had with Stanley Black & Decker? We're also an active participant of Project Cortex, uh, and, and as such, our work with clients is actually not limited to migration as much as how they can uh, kind of comprehensively look at how they can use you know what's available. Now, we've helped, in fact, instead of just going to SharePoint, migrate certain clients directly into Teams. And in some cases, actually, we've migrated folks directly into Yammer. The objective should not be lift and shift. The, the, our objective has always been how can they can make a more expanded use of what is available? Because really, in the last time of things, your objective to moving to uh, uh, SharePoint on the cloud beyond the fact that, let's just say, it eliminates much of the cost and the headache is the fact that it gives you significantly more improved tools and improved functionality that allow you to make a better use of it. One of the things that we have experienced in prior work we've done is and, I, and to be honest with you, it's not from other platforms to SharePoint as much as when people actually go to share, from SharePoint to SharePoint and we migrate them is once they better understand, especially what the power platforms uh, have the ability to deliver, what we have seen is a lot of add-on work that's related to that, especially as it pertains to how to make something, uh, let's just say, better deliver the business solutions than what it did previously. Not to say the server-based platforms did not accomplish you know, quite a bit, but there are many a time where some things were not so easy to do, but are very simple to deliver in these new platforms. So we, we, we have delved a lot more into that than, than in the past. When somebody goes from 
and non-SharePoint platform to uh, SharePoint on the other hand. And that's why I'm kind of very much uh, doing my conversation on that area only. Make no mistake about it. Initially, the trauma and the concern is heavily tied to, am I going to even survive this? So they're not really that focused on, okay, now that I have landed here, how can I move forward? And oftentimes also, you have to give them a bit of time to digest where they are. It's not that there's any crisis that occurred, but historically, I have noticed that when somebody goes from a non-SharePoint platform to SharePoint, there's about a year of decompress. So thank God that prior year is over. Now let's better understand what we can do with this thing. So that's how we have seen things pan out historically. I'd love to kind of get comment on your take on Microsoft innovation. So, you know, one thing, if we kind of take the long view, if you think back to what we were doing in this space five years ago, our pace of innovation was relatively slow, which has a different set of implications. Um, If you look at everything that we've been doing in the past four years with SharePoint Modern, with Teams integration, you know, with Project Cortex on the horizon, we're not slowing down pace of change on the platform. How do you read and react to, you know, what we're doing? What does that process look like for you when you figure out, you know, when to hop on an innovation and when to hold off? Well, I have done onto this platform 12 years ago and I, I decided not to let go. <laughs> so <laughs> at this point, I'm very much committed. But let me tell you an interesting uh, item that you don't get to see that I get to see. What used to happen about 10 years ago is, and I, I'm not going to lie to you, somebody has to be really thinking they want to use SharePoint for us to bring them over to SharePoint. The question is, what happened in the last five years? In the last five years, there is no mistaking that the amount of investment and the amount of innovation that's working in, that's existing in SharePoint outstrips all the other products combined. Because you got to remember, our organization is a very old content management uh, organization. We were, uh, well, partners with a lot of these companies for many years. What has happened may not be visible to you is I have a much easier conversation today talking to an organization that is trying to go to SharePoint from a different platform where I don't need to say much. Microsoft already pressed the gas pedal hard enough that they almost have no choice. And many a time they say, hey, this thing is flat out not working. I'm stuck with it. How do we go from here? You know, I'll give you a simple example. Stanley Black and Decker decided to go to SharePoint and absolve themselves out of e in 2003. So that chugged along, chugged along, chugged along. And approximately three years ago, they said, this is not even a discussion. That's it. It's over. We are going. So the thing that I think you guys may not notice that I notice much, much more significantly is, I'm going to say this nicely, the game is over. There is really one de facto standard that exists in the industry. And you got to remember, I started this 20 years ago when for a fact, there were other products that were the de facto standard. That's where things are. Well, we're not going to argue that one too much. <laughs> well, that is reality. But it's not because we, we're partners with you. We do understand. We, we certainly aim and strive to not only you know be competitive and, and stay ahead in areas. We know where strengths and weaknesses are. And I think the real value, though, and what Chris and I like to highlight with the particular partner episodes, but really through any episode, is... There, of course, is value in, in how we approach what we're building. We, we want to build the best that we can, but it really doesn't land with the proper amount of feedback, integration, reworking that we get with working with customers and partners. And, you know, if you look back a, a number of years, even before what this term we've now used, this modern era of SharePoint, there was a lot that people did on SharePoint, but there was a lot of frustration. And uh, I think the nice thing about Microsoft, and I hope for your companies as well, is uh, the status quo is never the same and it's never the same for everyone. Uh, So always thinking, what can we do better? What can we do next? What aren't people doing? Uh, And we certainly appreciate kudos and, and the work that you're doing to keep us 
and you and Stanley Black and Decker ahead of that curve, because I think through this conversation, anybody listening would realize it's not a, a just join Microsoft and, and off you go. There's a lot of work to get there. There's a lot of work to maintain. And I think to, to what Gary has shared, uh, which resonates, I think, with everything that everybody's saying is you have to be mindful of the end user and bring them along the journey or else they will turn on you. And that's a lot of wasted work if you if you don't involve them soon and often. Very true. I think to take it a step forward, statement I'll make is that the scale and space of innovation at, at the SharePoint, and this might sound bad to you guys, but is so fast that I oftentimes see that the capacity for people to understand what the benefits are is not happening, in fact, fast enough. And the reason is, there are so many new things added. There was a time when SharePoint had one new feature and everybody knew about it. Oh, yes. Today, there could be 50 new features. And as such, the capacity for people to digest the, the advantages of each one of them is, I think, in fact, to some extent, a challenge to people because they're saying, wait a second, they added this, 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 this. Okay, so how do I better understand each one of these? So the challenge, in fact, has flipped these days. It's not a case of they're not moving fast enough. You guys are moving very, very fast. And it's positive, to be honest with you, because different consume different features. Yeah, but Gary, from your customer perspective or, or your own perspective, just as somebody who's guiding decisions that then get implemented, how do you keep on top of what it is that we offer and then decide what you want to take advantage of? But to posit Joro's question on to you, how are you finding keeping up with the level of innovation from us and, and from any other vendor that you that you work with these days? Yeah, I think collaboration with the partner is key to that, staying in touch with them uh, and your account team, making sure that you you are aware of what's new and, and whether it's within an existing product or new products that are being introduced. Certainly, you have, you know, you're not going to implement everything, but you're certainly looking at those things. You're partnering on the other side with our businesses to understand what the, what their problems are or what their issues are that need to be addressed, or how we could improve their efficiencies. And you look to some sort of, you know, harmony and marriage there that you can bring the two together. Well, certainly the vendor, you know, has a big responsibility, I think, in, in keeping us educated. There's obviously a lot of material on the web and emails and goodness knows what else. But, you know, that collaboration with the partner themselves is probably the most um, direct path to get the latest and greatest information and in a clear and concise fashion where you can you can ask questions and, and understand it a little better. I would concur. I, I think Gary hit on the neck. Yeah. And the thing you need to understand is, just three, four years ago, we used to migrate everybody, to, for example, to a classic site. In short order, I mean, there's a lot of momentum around modern sites. So a lot of our, my work was on how to kind of build up modern sites. And immediately thereafter came teams. So, so, so what has happened is th there was a long period of very gradual movement of new offerings. But in short order, a lot of them have come. So at times, if I were to, to kind of point at something, I would say, there's a tendency for people to say, wait a second, is Microsoft going to make something cooler than this tomorrow? It's interesting to hear you put it in those terms because our CEO has famously said, it's, it's not our job to be cool or to make cool stuff, is to make stuff that helps other people be cool. We've had a pivot, I'd say internally, I don't know if it translates externally, over the past two years to really focus much more on the end results of the, imp the user impact as opposed to the really cool technology. There are places where Microsoft, I think, you know, we are way out in front in some of the augmented reality and, and quantum computing technologies. Not all of those translate to an immediate business impact, but some of the things they may seem incremental, but can have, you know, a huge impact, something as simple as, you know, teams allowing you to open up multiple windows. You know, sometimes it's the small changes are the ones that are the ones that can have the, the biggest impact. You're not only correct, but the truth is, it's cooler may not be the appropriate word. It, which one gives me the most options for us to have the most flexibility within our environment is that triggering point. It, that, that has essentially happened with a few of my clients. In fact, there have been a couple instances where everything got on hold because Microsoft is coming up with a, a new functionality. I really want to see that closer. I have, I remember when the teams came out and this, it, it, it kind of caused uh, uh, like a six-month delay on a couple of engagements because they're like, 
no, we want to understand this before we can proceed. So, so we are aggressively running around also to, to kind of bring them up to date on what are the plus and the minuses and how, from a migration perspective, that's going to work, how you can build on that and things along those lines. And sometimes if some functionality that could have existed in prior types of content they already own, be it in classic or modern, is the operative word is not deprecated, but may not exactly play the same way in the new environment. So that also causes some amount of latency. What at times has happened is, hey, I think this is going to give a significantly positive impact to my productivity. But the bigger question was, okay, first and foremost, is this the next the final thing, or is there something that's better than this that's over the horizon, say in 2021, subsequent to say my completion of my migration? Or, and the second aspect of it is, is this gonna have the functionality that's equivalent to the prior one such that, again, change management is not as impacted. I know it sounds crazy, but there's some functionality in the classic that is not existing in, in, in the subsequent platforms. They are odd little things, but people tend to gravitate to those things. You'd be surprised. I know that we're kind of approaching the end of this week's episode. I want to thank both of you for coming in and spending a little bit of time with us to educate our audience about what the experience has been with Stanley Black and Dicker. And always great to put it into real context. Where can people go to learn more about um, you and your organizations? Let me start start with you, Gary. With regard to learning a little more about Stanley Black and Decker, stanleyblackanddecker.com is obviously one place to go. We have a lot of other brand websites that will educate you on um, the tools that we sell and products and services that we also sell, not just a tools company, but you know, security solutions, healthcare, oil and gas, you know, engineered fastenings. The list, the list is, is pretty endless these days. So I'd say our websites are probably the best place to, to go and start there. And from Veranon, Joro, also, if you are speaking or presenting or sponsoring any upcoming events. I'm invited. I would add to Gary that any hardware store on this planet, uh, which is where I learn about standing Black & Decker tools every day. But uh, <laughs> going back to us, uh, Brian.com, I think, is your best source, you know, to be honest with you. By virtue of fact that, and, and we publish uh, quite a few uh, white uh, papers on especially a lot of the stuff that we do around content management. And as you know, with new innovation and new uh, uh, things happening, the stuff that we do is not something that's <laughs> told in, in small morsels, a la often Twitter. So it's not painful, but it requires you kind of to brief up on a couple pages to better understand how to handle a particular problem, no matter what it is, so whether it's virtual documents, what is migration from different platform, things along those lines. So I would say uh, our white paper section within our site is probably by far the best. Great. Well, we will find that and make sure we have the link in the show notes um, to promote more about what you do, but also I think just for people to get more under their under their hats and belts about how to do this, how to approach it, art of the possible, knowing that others have done it before them, I know is always reassuring, but the know-how uh, is always great to promote. But again, uh, Joro and Gary, thank you for sharing. Uh, we're really pleased to have you on the Microsoft 365 platform with sounds like more coming uh, and very pleased that your businesses and people uh, and culture and hopefully in this time of a little bit of uh, stress and difference are, are able to adjust and benefit and move forward in, in the ways that are, are good for your business and good for your people. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you very much for having us. Thank you. Up next on the Interzone Partner Edition is events. If there's an event going on somewhere in the world with our customers or partners, we want to help celebrate it here on the IntraZone. So Mark, I know you're looking at the same calendar as I am. What are some of the events that we are tracking here in the IntraZone studios? All right. So coming up fairly soon, November 17th through the 18th is our partner Quest's Tech 2020 event. And to be honest, Chris, I think you're more plugged into this one. I think you've got a, a slot and a speaking notion. So what, is, what are you doing with Quest? Um, yeah. So the Experts Conference is back after a couple of years hiatus. Quest brought the Experts Conference back as a live event last year. This year, obviously, um, they're expecting about 6,000 people to their virtual event. It's two days. It's very Microsoft themed, but not Microsoft exclusive. So tomorrow morning, I'm going to be splitting the keynote with Greg Taylor from our exchange team. Um, an event that I am 
not recording from the comfort of my own room, though, that's coming up is Global Con 4. That's coming up next month, December 1st through 4th. The agenda is a really long URL that I'm not going to read on the website. Those folks, they've really been hitting it with these impactful digital events. They've got into a good rhythm. Um, this is, as you might guess, the fourth one they've done this year, and we're really happy um, to be engaged with them. Yeah, the GlobalCon 4 team always has a great set of speakers. Uh, they also have a couple of pre-day events that they call Turbo Tuesdays. And at this GlobalCon 4 event, we're also maybe talking with them to squeeze in just after the main event, a special day of just Microsoft sessions. It would just be a handful uh, and some of the things that we have uh, that we'd like to communicate and, and support some live Q&A. So stay tuned there with a little bit more to come, but definitely a great uh, agenda already with GlobalCon 4. Just around the corner, really uh, just a few days after GlobalCon 4, is the Microsoft 365 Collaboration Conference. And this is their virtual instance. But from a virtual perspective, December 9th through the 11th, you'll have a lot of different keynotes from Caruana, Gatamu. You'll have, of course, Jeff Teeper, your representation from uh, the Azure team, and a number of different uh, Microsoft-led keynotes with a lot of involvement from the community and MVPs. It's about half and half if I squint at their content plan. Uh, so another great online event, December 9th through the 11th, Microsoft 365 Collaboration Conference. And then ongoing from now into January 2021, um, our friends at, at SP Fest are running virtual workshops. So this is a chance to get connected with Microsoft team members or MVPs to learn about SharePoint, OneDrive, Power BI, Teams, Lists, uh, maybe even Cortex and more. And we'll have the link to that in the show notes. Yeah. And one thing, Chris, that I'll do that'll be kind of fun in the show notes for this one is I've already delivered my Microsoft List workshop with the SharePoint Fest team. And I created a list of all of their workshops. And I'll do just a fun screen capture with the gallery view so you can see all the speakers and all their upcoming sessions. It was kind of fun list to put together. But... Throughout all of these events, you get connected, you network, ask your questions, stay tuned for what's coming for things that you're um, wanting to plug into. And if you don't see it, make sure to raise that to the community. You can reach out to Chris and I that you're wanting to see a session on X or where can I find out more about why. Um, let us know. Always great to plug into these events um, and hope to see you at one virtually soon. And of course, if you are hosting or sponsoring a virtual event or someday again, a real world event, please let us know. We'd love to spotlight it on a future episode of The Intro Zone. Well, that's it. That's a wrap. I am very thankful as we're approaching American Thanksgiving to be concluding yet another episode of The Intro Zone Partner Edition. I want to thank our guests, Juro Ainu and Gary Moss, for sitting down with us here today. And thank you, thanks to you as well, Mark. Absolutely. Thank you for your time. And it was really great to hear from uh, Veronon and Stanley Black and Decker. It, it helps to clarify what may pose as a challenge, moving that much content from A to B with very different source and destination, but very doable. And it's a great approach that they took. For everything else, you can check out our show page and links to everything that was discussed today and more. Go to aka.ms slash The Interzone. If you're interested in other shows by Microsoft, check out aka.ms slash Microsoft slash podcasts. You can always send questions or feedback for the SharePoint engineering and product teams. Email us at theintrazone at microsoft.com or reach us on Twitter at SharePoint, at mcashman, and at cmcnulty.com. 2000. If you enjoy the show and you want to help others find it, please rate and review the show. Tell your friends and colleagues about the show. You can share that SharePoint love anytime, anywhere. And of course, subscribe where you get your podcasts. Thanks again for listening. We're your hosts, Chris McNulty and Mark Cashman. And you've been listening to The Intro Zone, a show about the Microsoft 365 partner-powered intelligent intranet.